Hello, everybody. So I'm very glad to uh, share these new uh, results about uh, Albert Smithite in this context of uh, Emergent Excitations Day here at uh, IQ. Okay, so first of all, I would like to thank uh, all the people involved in these uh, studies of uh, Albert Smithite. So uh, for me, it started during my PhD at uh, LPSRC in France, so with uh, Philippe Mendels and uh, Fabrice Baer. So we did some uh, NMR study. And uh, we did also a specific heat study at high magnetic fields uh, with the help of uh, Alban de Muir, Christophe Marsena, and Thierry Klein, uh, that you know, the two last of, of them. And um, uh, now I am here uh, in Sherbrooke. So we did some thermal transport measurements with uh, Etienne Lefrancois and Jordan Baglow in the group of uh, Louis Taifer. So our samples come from uh, Mathias Velasquez in Grenoble. And on the Tory side, we have a very nice collaboration with uh, Laura Messiaud and Bernard Bernu in Paris. Uh, we developed uh, a numerical technique, uh, which is uh, uh, low temperature extrapolations of high temperature series expansions for the susceptibility and the specific heat, for instance. OK, so first, I would like to uh, recall some concepts about uh, quantum spin liquids. So uh, the, the basic picture for quantum spin liquid is that of uh, MOTS insulator which lacks magnetic order uh, associated with spontaneous symmetry breaking at low temperature, meaning at temperature where the spin fluctuations are essentially quantum, uh, well below the vice temperature. But in fact, there are several states that would fit into this category without actually being a true quantum spin liquids. So a better definition would be to say that a quantum spin liquid has a macroscopic entanglement and that it supports some uh, mobile fractionalized spin excitations. So these uh, states are really the place of emergent phenomena uh, with these uh, new spin excitations that we call spinons. And depending on the case, the spinons can be either fermions or bosons or Majorana fermions. And you have also these emergent gauge fields to encode uh, the interactions of the spinons on the lattice. So obviously, this is very hard to check uh, experimentally and uh, in a first approach to simplify, to determine the class of uh, spin liquid, we distinguish uh, between the gapless and the gapped spin liquid, depending if there is a, a gap in the spin excitation spectrum. And uh, now there is <laughs> quite a few uh, people that are not convinced about the existence of uh, quantum spin liquids. Maybe this is because uh, of the accumulation of recent results on the, the Kitayev uh, systems that, that are really controversial. But I have to recall that uh, uh, at least in one dimension, uh, quantum spin liquids are exactly found in theoretical models and that the predictions uh, are verified experimentally. Okay, so and in two dimensions, it is much harder to, to check the existence of a quantum spin liquid, but uh, this quest for quantum spin liquid in 2D was motivated by the ideas of uh, Anderson, who suggested that the quantum spin liquid would be an intermediate between the nail state and the superconducting state in cuprates under the influence of doping. Okay, so one road for the quantum spin liquid in 2D uh, is the, the Kitayev model but it is a quite complex model based on anisotropic interactions on the honeycomb lattice. So we can take a, a simpler approach. So let's consider the nearest neighbor antiferromagnetic Eisenberg Hamiltonian, so Hamiltonian, and let's see how to uh, destabilize uh, the standard nail order by enhancing the quantum fluctuations, meaning that we want to promote this kind of singlet states when we consider small spins one half. So here I have written the classical energy for a given nail state on the lattice. So as you can see, it depends on Z, the coordination number of the lattice, and on the angle between the boy spins. And here I have written the quantum energy of a singlet paving. And as you can see on the square lattice, the classical energy is much lower than the quantum energy, so a nail state is stabilized we can switch to the triangular lattice, which is a first stated lattice. So now the best compromise for the spins is to set at 120 degrees from each other. So the classical energy is a little bit enhanced and now it's comparable to the quantum energy. And really to make this classical energy higher, we need to switch to the Kagome lattice by reducing the coordination number. So the Kagome lattice is a lattice of corner-sharing triangles, and now the coordination is four instead of six. 
and the quantum energy is lower than the classical energy. So in principle, on the Kagome lattice, we can stabilize some singlet states. But we have to keep in mind that uh, such a singlet paving here is a frozen state. It's like a solid, it breaks some symmetries. It's not a quantum spin liquid. But actually, on the Kagome lattice, there is a huge number of such uh, singlet pavings with the same energy. And we can even consider uh, short range and long range singlets. And at the end, this extensive degeneracy offers the possibility of a resonating ground state between all possible configurations. So this will be a resonating valence bond state, our prototype for quantum spin liquid on the Kagome lattice. Okay, so uh, a little bit of water. So it's um, a bit um, frustrating to see that uh, uh, this uh, toy model on the Kagome lattice, even if it is simple in appearance, is not solved today, not at all. So first, it is a, a theoretical and numerical challenge to determine the ground state because there is no analytical solution. And because on the numerical side, uh, there are a lot of possible ground states. They are very distinct in nature, but uh, their energy is very comparable. So it's hard to tell which one is a true ground state. So now there is a, a consensus about uh, a quantum spin liquid ground state, but not on the class, is it gapped or gapless. So this gap will correspond to the breaking of one singlet and then the creation of two spin ons that will be then free to delocalize over the lattice because we can reorganize the singlets at no energy cost. And in the recent years, there is an accumulation of numerical studies pointing to the stabilization of a gapless spin liquid. So this would be like a critical quantum spin liquid with a fermionic spin ons dispersing along Dirac cones close to the Fermi level, or some descending states of this one when you include some spin on pairing terms and you end up with a spin on Fermi surface, small one. And uh, in the cases where there is a spin gap, the spin gap is found quite small on the order of 10% of J. So it is also a difficult problem on the experimental side because most of the candidate materials uh, are real materials and they in include some perturbations that are inevitable and they often induce magnetic freezing or ordering at low temperature. And uh, as we will see, Albert Smith site is one of the only exceptions. So it's uh, quite impressive to see that all the candidate materials we have today are found as minerals in nature. They are beautiful, I put a few here. And uh, among all these uh, uh, materials, Abersmithite really is an emblematic compound because it has a perfect Kagome geometry. All the other, or most of the other, include some uh, uh, distortions of the Kagome lattice, and this is problematic to obtain a quantum spin liquid ground state. Okay, so in Abersmithite, the magnetism is driven by these uh, copper ions of uh, spin one half, blue uh, balls here, and they decorate uh, geometrically perfect Kagome planes, meaning that all the triangles here are equilateral. And these Kagome planes are well separated by uh, layers of diamagnetic ions. So in principle, the magnetism is very two-dimensional. So if you combine some macroscopic measurements of susceptibility, to instance, and, and theoretical computations, you end up with uh, the fact that uh, the, the first, the nearest, nearest, the nearest neighbor coupling between uh, these, uh, these uh, copper spins, which is antiferromagnetic on the order of 190K, is clearly dominant be, uh, among the couplings within the planes and between the planes. And in fact, uh, you need also really, really high magnetic fields in order to compete with this uh, antiferromagnetic coupling. I think the first magnetization plateau in Albert Smith site is found at 150 Tesla, for instance. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's huge fields. Uh, in the Hamiltonian, all the other terms like the jalousinski moria interaction can be treated as perturbations because they are really small. And the main perturbation is coming from the fact that about 20% of the zinc sites are in fact occupied by copper ions, meaning that we have an assembly in principle of nearly three spins one half, but we will see that the picture is more complex in the, in the following. So these uh, magnetic defects 
they are troublesome because they have a magnetic response at low temperature and low magnetic field that will mask the intrinsic Kagome behavior that we are interested in. So uh, for instance, we have a Curie tail in the susceptibility and a Schottky anomaly in the specific heat. But apart from these defects, uh, Albert Smith site is a very, very good realization of the toy model on the Kagome lattice. Uh, for instance, zero field mu SR, so muon spin rotation, show no sign of magnetic ordering of freezing down to 20 millik, which is about uh, J over 9,000. And in uh, zero field inelastic neutron scattering, there is no sign of conventional magnons. Instead, we have a broad continuum at low energy, which is characteristic of fractionalized spin excitations. So Albert Smith site is really an emblematic quantum spin liquid candidate in 2D. And it was really appealing for uh, uh, detailed studies with NMR, specific heat, and thermal transport. So I already presented the, the results of NMR and specific heat uh, at our QMP. So uh, I, I'm just going to, uh, to recall the main conclusions, and then I will switch to the thermal transport. So with NMR, we did some measurements of the static local susceptibility through nine shift measurements, K. We did also some uh, measurements of the dynamical local susceptibility with a uh, relaxation rate, one over T1. And the main conclusion was that the ground state is gapless for a majority of copper sites. And it was found compatible with this picture of a critical spin liquid with the spin on dispersing along direct cones. Uh, so we did also this uh, specific heat study. So we needed really high magnetic fields because we wanted to push uh, this uh, Schottky anomaly to high temperatures in order to have this, uh, this low energy range where we can probe the Kagome contribution alone. And so I will skip the, the details. So this is the raw data. And uh, the main conclusion was obtained by a, a very uh, in-depth uh, analysis with uh, this uh, numerical method uh, by Bernard Bernou and Laura Messio. So we have three conclusions. So first one, is that uh, the ground state appears gapless because we have a, a non fluvial power law of the specific heat in the, in the low temperature uh, limit. So with a, a, a weird exponent, alpha, which is close to 1.5. The second conclusion is that uh, this uh, Kagome specific heat is field independent, at least from zero to 34 Tesla. So it's really confusing because when you expect some uh, fermionic excitations, they could create, in principle, some Fermi pockets or Landau levels in magnetic field. So this field independence of the specific heat really puts into question the fermionic nature of the potential spin on in a basmi site. And uh, the last conclusion was that uh, these uh, magnetic coppers in between the Kagome planes they induce some magnetic dilution inside the Kagome planes. So they are not exactly nearly free spins one half. They also extend into the planes and create some effective dilution. So it is the first indication that these magnetic defects are a bit uh, complex and needs uh, more understanding now. So uh, with the specific kit, we have the indication that uh, there is a large amount of uh, spin excitations that are intrinsic to the Kagome planes at low temperature but we still don't understand their, their nature. And one way uh, to, to obtain more information is to do thermal transport. So with thermal transport, we probe only mobile heat carriers. So in the quantum materials, uh, we have the phonons, of course, that are the, the primal heat carriers, but you can have also contribution from uh, heat inherent electrons, mobile spinons. So in case of uh, mobile spinons, mobile fermionic spinons, you expect a residual term in kappa xx divided by t in the t2 so kappa xx is the longitudinal thermal uh, conductivity and in inverse me site you have also dialoskin shimoria interaction which is small but still uh, present and in combination with uh, the magnetic field this can create a given gauge flux di distribution so these gauge fluxes are, are related to the uh, emergent uh, uh, gauge fields that describe the, the spin on interactions on the lattice and in principle, this can create a finite uh, kappa xy, sizable kappa xy. So the thermal hole conductivity, which is also related to kappa xx, and it has this kind of shape as a function of temperature. So before going to the case of Herbert Smith site, uh, we can first concentrate on a system where we are sure to find some fermionic spin-ons. 
So as I told you before, uh, if, if we look at this one-dimensional model, so the spin one half anti-ferromagnetic Heisenberg chain, this is a model that is exactly solvable uh, by the better ansatz, and the ground state is a quantum spin liquid, so the superposition of these two uh, singlets paving, and the excitations are uh, spin one half uh, fermionic spin ons. So it is easy to see in the easing limit. So when you break one singlet and you create two spins with the same orientation, you have a, a domain wall at uh, time t0. And then because you can reorganize the singlets, this domain wall can split into two domain walls. So these two fractionalized excitations, uh, the spin ons. And when you uh, put a magnetic field that is sufficient to fully polarize uh, the chain, uh, you don't have spin ons anymore, you have conventional magnons. So this is beautifully seen in, uh, in elastic neutron scattering measurements on this uh, simple material, copper sulfate. So you see in zero field, you have uh, exactly the measurement is, is corresponding to the prediction for fermionic spin-ons. And we, when you put a field, you end up with the dispersion of conventional magnons. And it translates also very well in terms of thermal transport. So here it is not copper sulfate anymore, it's copper benzoate, but it is also very good realization of this uh, model. And you see that in zero field, so you end up with a, an additional term on top of the phonon term in kappa. So this term will be kappa S and will correspond to fermionic spin ons So you have a residual term in the T to zero limit. And as soon as you put a, a magnetic field that is sufficient to polarize the chain, you end up with a pure bosonic behavior in T cube because you have magnons that are bosons and phonons. And if you look at this kappa S term, so the spin on term divided by T as a function of temperature, you have this beautiful residual term that is really uh, the unambiguous detection of fractionalized excitations in a quantum magnet. So in this case, this is a one dimensional quantum magnet. And we would like to extend this kind of measurements to two dimensions, uh, for instance, in the case of Herbert Smith site. So you see that there is a a, a, a fast decrease of kappa s below a very low temperature that is indicated by these black arrows. And this can be understood in terms of spin on phonon decoupling, meaning that at the hot end of the sample, uh, the primal heat carriers are the phonons, and they provide the heat to spin ons at a given rate. And at low temperature, this rate is rapidly falling. So you obtain this uh, really uh, anomalous decrease of uh, kappa s. So both uh, these residual term and this anomalous decrease are the distinct signatures of fractionalized excitations of fermionic spin ons in a quantum magnet. And this is not observed at all in the case of Herbert Smith site. If you look at uh, our zero Tesla data, which correspond to the dark blue curves, you see that they extrapolate to zero at T to zero. There is no anomalous decrease, so there is no residual term. And it means that the main heat carriers are the phonons. And because uh, the, the, these curves are well below the estimate of the phonon curve in the boundary scattering limit, we understand that the phonons are heavily scattered by some uh, spin uh, fluctuations. So this result is really compatible with the, the two other uh, studies that were recently published by the Fudan group and the Kyoto group. So no residual term. And it means that there is no sizable contribution by phonons, by uh, spin ons to the thermal transport. We did also some thermal all measurements. So here I plot the kappa xy over kappa xx as a function of temperature. And you see that for Albert Smith site, it remains vanishingly small over the whole temperature range, where it is fine, small but finite and well resolved in two other quantum magnets like. Uh, alpha retinum trichloride and copper tellurium oxide. So it means that there is no spin on kappa xy. It was expected because of the lack of a residual term. But most uh, interestingly, in these two um, other compounds, the, the thermal all effect was attributed to phonons because of some uh, spin phonon coupling. So it means that in Amber Smith site, there is no phonon all effect also. This is interesting. It means that uh, the surrounding magnetic state is really of prime importance to explain the origin of a phonon all effect. 
Uh, I have a question. Okay. Hello, it's uh, William from Zoom. So, uh, <clears throat> Uh, when you say that uh, <clears throat> there's no spin-on contribution, you mean there's no uh, Fermi surface of spin-ons that contribute. But, yes. uh, okay, the algebraic Dirac spin liquid without any uh, DM term doesn't have a Fermi surface. And uh, then you're saying that with a DM Fermi surf uh, with a DM term, you would have a Fermi surface, but uh, I'm not exactly sure the size of which and uh, how big this contribution would be, but uh, at large enough temperatures in a direct spin liquid, even if you have a small Fermi surface, uh, you won't have this uh, residual contribution because it's a uh, Dirac fermions. So uh, uh, case, why do you say that there's no uh, spin on kappa XY uh, so generally? So even in case of um, Dirac spinons, we expect that uh, we have a small uh, Fermi surface because of the presence of impurities. So we should obtain um, a linear term. Yes, but uh, this linear term could be uh, small. It depends on the size of the Fermi surface and the temperature at which uh, you are working. So yes, it is true. But I, I personally am not so convinced about the statement. Uh, but maybe you have other analysis that uh, is more quantitative. But uh... so, yes, exactly. My statement is not to say that there are no mobile spin-ons. Actually, this is my well. Next... I... <laughs> yes, yeah, so you write no spin on kappa x y. No, no visible spin on kappa x y. Uh, I mean, but if the Fermi surface is small enough and temperature is above the Fermi energy, then the spin on would not contribute the residual term. Yes. So okay. th this is normal that we do not see any uh, kappa x y. Mm -hmm. It is small. It is well below our experimental accuracy. So the, the message here is not to tell that there are no mobile spin-ons. It's just to say that we do not observe a thermal Hall effect. So if there is a spin-on thermal Hall effect, it is very small. And if there is a phonon Hall effect, it is very small also. Mm -hmm. At all. Okay. And this was my uh, next uh, slide. <laughs> just to say that we do not observe a finite uh, residual term at low temperature. It's not... Uh, proving that there are no mobile spin-ons because in quantum spin liquids, the spin-ons are not fully free to delocalize. There are some rules because of these emergent gauge fields and also because of the presence of defects. So we can imagine some scenario where the spin-ons are trapped by some magnetic defects. We can also imagine scenario where the spin-ons are bound to delocalize over closed loops only. And at the end, uh, the spin-on transport spin on e-transport is not efficient at the scale of our measurement. So this is maybe why we do not detect also a, a, a residual term and a thermal Hall effect. Uh, I don't know if I answer to your question. Uh, I don't uh, entirely agree with the conclusion, but uh, please continue. I mean, uh... Okay. <laughs> okay, so... To continue, I will come back to this uh, comparison of our data to uh, the Fudan and Kyoto data. So uh, as you can see, uh, in the Kyoto data, there is no field dependence at all, but they measured only two magnetic fields, uh, 0 and 14 Tesla. The Fudan data, there is a slight field dependence, but it is very, very small, and it seems to peak around 6 Tesla. So this is quite in contradiction with our results, at least for the DHS sample, where we observe a clear field dependence. So we extended the measurements to high temperatures, and we see that there is a clear field dependence appearing below about 20K. And uh, first, it is monotonic between 20K and 2K. And below 2K, it becomes non-monotonic, as in the case of the food and study. But it is much more clear here. So uh, if we concentrate on this uh, temperature range where we have the monotonic field dependence can be understood in terms that uh, when you increase the magnetic field intensity, you are gradually polarizing some spins. Then you, you uh, remove some spin fluctuations. The phonons are less scattered and then you increase uh, the kappa XX. So this is interesting because uh, the, uh, the as I told you before, the, the Kagome spins are not easy to polarize. They need very, very high fields, like uh, 
more than 110 star. So it, in 15 Tesla, to obtain such a clear field dependence, it means that we are polarizing some magnetic defects. And these magnetic defects, they do not exist when the quantum spin liquid is not present, because at high temperatures, all the spins are really uh, uh, non, I don't know how to say, uh, they are indif indifferentiated at high temperature. And when the quantum spin liquid uh, establishes, some spins are, are left apart and become the magnetic defects. So we think that this appearance of the field dependence below about 20K really reveals the onset of the quantum spin liquid regime in the Bersmith site. And what is also interesting is that we can extract the magnetization profile of these uh, scattering centers, so of some of the magnetic defects, by looking, for instance, at the relative um, uh, variation of kappa in this range with respect to the zero field value. So this is what is represented here, uh, delta kappa xx. And I can track the position of the maxima and put this maxima in the scale of GMUBB over two cavity just to do a comparison with the Brie 1 function, which is expected in the case of paramagnetic spins one half. And as you can see, the two are completely different. So I cannot compare directly the magnitude of the two curves, but the shape is clearly different. For the Brie 1 function, you expect a linear start, and here we observe a more convex start. So this is another indication that the magnetic defects are not really uh, uh, nearly free spins one half, they are much more complex than that. We can have also this uh, initial convex increase by another way. So it's a bit more complex. So first I deduce uh, the phonon curve of kappa xx in the absence of uh, magnetic scattering. So this is uh, the black dotted line. This is obtained by the dubai callaway model by fitting the high temperatures and by fixing the low temperature regime. And then I can look at the ratio between this curve, this extrema, and the actual data. So I can compute a quantity that I call psi. And this psi is related to the density of spin fluctuations in both the Kagome and defect spin systems with some couplings uh, lambda. And so I can fit this psi data, and I obtain the magnetization profile of the, of the magnetic defects. And you see that there is also this initial convex increase. So by two different ways, we have identified that the magnetic defects in a Bersmi site are much more complex than nearly plus minus one half. They are coupled to the Kagome planes. They create some magnetic dilution inside. And maybe we have to consider some entities like that, where uh, the this spin, this intermediate spin, is coupled to three spins on top and three spins at the bottom. So it's a multimer. It can have a, a doublet spin one half one state, but it is it has a, a much more complex magnetization process than the, the case of uh, paramagnetic spins. So at the end, uh, the nature of the ground state of our best site still remains enigmatic. We don't understand really the nature of the exotic spin excitations. Uh, we know that there is a uh, quite a large amount of spin excitations at low temperatures intrinsic to the Kagome planes, but we don't know really if they are mobile or not, if they, are, if they have fermionic statistics. And uh, our analysis for the magnetic defects uh, magnetization uh, gives a new uh, impulse to the, to the theoretical work now to try to model uh, these, uh, these defects. So with that, uh, I want to thank you for your attention. And uh, I am done. Are there other questions either here in Sherbrooke or on Zoom? Uh, hi, I, I have a question. Go ahead. So uh, on page 16, uh, you show the Sumoho angle for three different material. Uh, yeah, here. So, uh, so for this Herbert's missile, around 20K, uh, below 20K, the, the Sumoho angle seems to be kind of increasing. Is that some? Uh... Maybe it's real. Uh, so you have good eyes to, to pick that. So uh, in fact, uh, below 20K or 10K, so we use thermocouples for doing these measurements. And thermocouples, they, they lose their sensitivity at low temperatures. 
And given that the signal is really small, it is in the, in the noise level, uh, we don't know if we have to trust uh, these, uh, these points. The, the main message is to tell that it is small. Uh -huh. It's possible that there is a thermal oil effect, but it is small. That's all. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, that, that's what I want to ask. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, I have a question in uh, Zoom, mm -hmm. if yep. no one else. Uh, yes, yeah, so have you measured uh, the heat conductivity along the C-axis out of plane? Because this is uh, kappa xy, but yes, out of plane. So this is a, a good uh, measurement to do because uh, it's right that uh, along the C-axis, phonons are the main heat carriers. So if we also observe uh, a vanishingly small uh, kappa xy, in this configuration, it means that there is really no phonon kappa xy. But we have not done that yet. Is it because the sample is uh, too difficult to get in the geometry or? Uh... Yeah, the samples are quite small and uh, difficult to, uh, to cut in the right uh, configuration. But uh, if it is uh, really uh, an interesting measurement to do, we can do it. Uh, it, it will just take some time. Okay, yes, I think it would be interesting, but if you have other things to do, then <laughs> thank you. I have a question uh, from Eurus of Montreal. The room? Can yes, you hear? Yeah. Uh, in the other two samples uh, from the other groups, are the magnitudes all the same? Uh, yes, um, so I didn't put the comparison uh, on the same plot here, but uh, if I have to draw uh, this data uh, on uh, on this uh, on this plot, they would fall uh, in between uh, the two sets of data for the two samples. So in between the DHS data and the PHS data. Actually, the the plot is in uh, the archive paper. Okay, thank you. All right, no more questions. Well, let's thank our speaker again then.